want to first say thank you again. My name is Melissa Altman. I'm the Regional Preparedness Manager for the Southern California Region American Red Cross. It is my honor to teach preparedness within this region. We have a lot of things to go over today, so I won't waste a lot of your time. But one thing I really want to stress is that today is not just about hearing information and going about your day. The purpose of today is to take action. I would like you to do something today or this week at the very latest, take action to make sure you take steps to be more prepared. We have all seen when people are not prepared what things can happen and we don't want you to be a statistic. So please, please go home today and do something to make sure you and your loved ones are gonna be safe from a disaster. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna start off with the first question we have. We're gonna have questions throughout this presentation that I want your participation in. Uh, the first one is gonna be a little to see what you know about floods. So Randy, can you launch that first poll? I sure can. Awesome, so, That first question is, the Stanford University researchers released a study that found floods from intensifying rainfall fueled by climate change have caused this amount of damage to the United States over the past three decades. So what do you think? All right, I see some answers coming in. And mind you, this actually doesn't have anything to do with hurricanes. This is actually just with uh, rainfall. Let's see what you got. Uh, this study was actually just released in January. So it's just new information that they uh, found out. We've got almost everybody responding. All right, I love it. Let's see what uh, let's see what that looks like. Yeah, let's see it. All right. And guess what? The majority of you are right. Seventy five billion dollars that this it has cost the United States. That's just the United States. And again, that is just for the rainfall. 75 billion. So flooding is extremely destructive and it costs our nation a ton of money. All right. Thank you. That's, I, 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 it's eye opening. I will say I read that and I was pretty shocked to hear it. So let's talk about it a little bit. So you may have seen on the news all sorts of things happening. It has been a rough year. And I say that as an understatement. Uh, we saw one of the most devastating wildfire seasons we've seen in a long time here in California. And with the coronavirus, it's been awful. I feel for you because I think all of us are going through it. It's been a really rough year. But disasters don't stop just because it's a rough year. Take a look at your screen. This is just from January in California alone. I mean, from mudslides to uh, tons of snow, huge flooding. Do you see it? Big Sur Highway 1 again fell into the ocean? So this is just our January. I mean, we've had it rough, but they don't stop. They don't stop just because you don't want another one to happen. And don't think that this won't happen to you. Uh, time and time again, the Red Cross goes on responses, whether it be to a big disaster or even a small home fire. And time and time again, People will say to us, I never thought it would happen. I never thought it would happen to us. Well, I'm here to tell you it very well could. And I want you to take steps today so that you prevent this kind of uh, huge disasters throwing off your life completely. These are just simple steps you can take today to make sure that you and your loved ones are gonna be safe and have the necessary uh, tools to get through them and recover quicker. So I wanna talk a little bit about how they start. So the floods are, are, again, they are all over everywhere and destructive. So they occur when water overflows in an area that's typically not, uh, that typically doesn't have water. And again, this happens in every single state in the United States. There's not one place that hasn't had flooding. So uh, get this. So in the past uh, decade, the United States has seen historic floods. You'll see them, uh, again, some of the reasons they occur are the, the melting snow or the extended periods of rain, but even that intense rain. We've had it here in San Diego where a, just a very short period of time has a huge downpour and it just completely overran our city. 
Uh, so dams and levees will break down. And even we had drain failure here in San Diego that backed up all that water and had no place to go except in people's homes. And you've seen in the news, the hurricanes. The hurricanes obviously bring a ton of rain with them and with that comes flooding. So we know that these are happening. It happens all the time and it can happen anywhere to anyone, including our loving pets and it can destroy your properties. So we want you to be aware of where these occur so that you can be prepared and take these steps. So I'm gonna bring up a map here. This is actually a map of Southern California that shows all the higher risk areas in pink. So that pink coloring um, really shows all the ways the, the water can go. Um, as you can imagine, the water has to go down the mountain and typically it goes through a certain determined path. All of those paths tend to get overran when there's heavy rain. And so the map shows you that it's all over. All the lakes and rivers, they are, they are very high risk for that um, flooding. And get this statistic, I, this blew me, oh, blew me away. So since 1950, flood disasters have been declared in every California county at least 10 times, and with some counties having a many, as many as 29 state and federal disaster declarations. So imagine that. So at least every county has had it 10 times, but some as many as 29 have had federal or state disaster declarations. So this is happening all the time, everywhere, and you don't wanna be caught off guard. So with that, we have another question for you. I wanna see what you know about what it takes to knock you off your feet. Randy, you got the next question? I do. So that question is, how many inches of moving water can knock an adult down? I should have brought my Jeopardy music. I know, right? Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, you don't want me to sing. You definitely don't. <laughs> All right. I think we're doing well. Da, yeah. da, da, da. What do we got? What are the results? All righty. Yes. You guys are right. It takes a mere six inches to knock you off your feet. And, and that shocked me when I first heard that statistic because that is not very much. You can imagine what six inches of rainwater looks like, but it's actually the power behind that rain that can sweep you off your feet. And I know here in Southern California, we've seen people get dragged out to sea because they were caught off guard. So that is shocking to me. All right, let's see what else we got going on. I wanna talk about the risks. So the risks, are obvious to some circumstance, but I don't think people really realize the long-term effects that flood can have. So as I mentioned, floods can happen anywhere and all the time. Um, the flood waters are extremely powerful. So every year in the United States, flood kill, floods kill 93 people. So that's a lot, just from floods. And um, they can cause billions of dollars of damage, which we learned, but it's about not only the um, drowning risk, the damage to the land and property and buildings, but it's also that contaminated water. So a lot of times flooding can contaminate water systems. You may have seen in Texas right now, they're actually boiling their water because just that the water system got compromised. And when that happens, um, you don't, if you don't have water in your household, you can't drink the water. So they're recommending boiling it, but a lot of times that's not even an option. So that contaminated water, it can be a really, um, a really big deal for a lot of people if they don't have clean drinking water. And then mold. Mold is one of the worst things about, um, about water damage. Um, if you survive it, that survive the initial flood, it's that mold afterwards that can creep on you. So a lot of people think just because they mopped up the water in their home that they're okay, but that water seeps very quickly into drywall, for example, and that mold will instantaneously grow. And so the mold is what can, can kill a lot of people afterwards. It's very harmful, harmful to your health. So you really wanna protect yourselves and make sure that you're doing a proper cleanup. There's inspections that you can have to make sure you don't have mold in your household. Um, but it, it is very serious. Um, the other thing I have to mention, um, I know homeowners insurance does co cover some flood 
But if you live in a flood area, I really highly recommend consider, that, consider buying that flood insurance. So flood insurance will um, better protect you if you do experience something like that. And not only about uh, the damage to your home, but what about even how, where are you gonna go? Um, will your insurance cover you to be relocated somewhere as the fixes to your home um, are made? So just think about it because it is really uh, important. Because of the mold issue, it's a lot, a lot of times a very long recovery um, and, and uh, rehab on the house has to, has to take sometimes months. Uh, and with that, I will say our main three steps about preparedness, we, you may have heard other presentations already, but we say get a kit, make a plan, be informed. Those are the three things that we're pushing um, for you to do now so that you're better prepared. So we're not gonna really spend, oh, go ahead, Randy. Hey, Melissa. You yeah. know, we talked about uh, how much water it took uh, to move a human. Oh, yeah. Well, what if I decided, well, I'm gonna get in my car. Uh, I think we have another poll question about uh, that. Let's bring it up, go ahead. So the question is, how many inches of moving water can float most vehicles? Because I think I'm gonna be safe in my car. I think a lot of people do. <clears throat> and I think a lot of people overestimate um, what kind of um, water their cars can go through. Every year, I think we see it. All right, well, let's see what people are saying. All right, I'm gonna give them two more. Dum, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> I like All the right. bum bum bum. <laughs> what we All right. <clears throat> so most of you said eight inches. And no, that is not correct. It is actually 24 inches. About two feet of water will actually float a vehicle. And you probably have seen in the news when vehicles get taken out, they will drift down um, roads on in that water of two feet. That roaring water is just so dangerous. So oh, yeah, no, one, no one even guessed 24. I threw you all off by making it the, the worst case scenario, didn't I? <laughs> well, while we're here, Melissa, I did get a question about uh, getting the citation for that uh, study. That oh. was the Southern Cal what was the Stanford study, I think it was. Yep. And, yeah. then, and then the other one was, uh, can we also get the site for the county flood declaration? Uh, absolutely. So, well, I will say we can do this citation study um, at the end. And actually, for that person, I'd recommend they send me an email because we can we can talk about it and I can send them the link. Um, the, uh, the county stuff, though, it depends by county. So I'm in San Diego County, uh, but depending on where you live, it will be, it will be different. So uh, I would recommend that person, too, just send me an email. Uh, and again, I will write my email in the chat. Um, a little bit later. That way you can reach out to me directly to make sure that you have all your questions answered and I can provide that information. But Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Randy. Appreciate you doing that. All right. So going back to this, we're going to not spend as much time on the get a kit because we all should have a kit. If you saw the picture of me earlier, the very nerdy one, um, you'll see all of my items in my emergency kit. So I take it very seriously, as should you, because you never know when these disasters are gonna hit. What we are gonna talk about though, is about the planning. Uh, it is so crucial for you to be planned, to have a plan ahead of time and it communicated so that everyone knows what to do and where to go. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna go into how you need to plan your evacuation. Uh, I would first visit this website listed on, on the screen. This will actually tell you whether or not you're in a flood zone. Uh, everyone, of course, has a risk of being in a flood zone. Um, I mean, there's actually a risk anywhere you live. For example, if your sewage backs up, your, your um, local neighborhood could always get flooded. But this is a map of where you have a higher risk and you are technically in a determined flood zone. So check it out, see where you're not only your home is, but also where you work. So if you're gonna spend time in those areas quite often, you should know uh, if there is a risk of flood. Now, once you determine what your risk is, always have two routes out of your, out of your uh, neighborhood from your house and also from your work. So just imagine that if there are flooded streets, do you have a second way out? Um, and that 
those routes should also be communicated. Does your whole family know? Um, I was having a conversation with a family that had a young teenage daughter that recently started driving. Does your teenager know how to get out of um, the neighborhood if they, you can't go a typical route? Um, and where are you gonna meet? A lot of times the infrastructure like uh, telecommunications gets turned gets turned off during emergency. And so what do you do? How do you communicate with each other if you can't call each other? Well, have a plan, have a communicated plan ahead of time so that if you are separated, for example, if uh, your kids are in school and your um, partner is at work and you're at home, how are you all gonna know where to meet if you have to evacuate the home? And, and how are you gonna make sure each other are safe? So have that plan communicated. The other thing I mentioned is where you're gonna stay. So the American Red Cross, we that's one of the main things we do is sheltering those that are affected by disaster. Um, if they get evacuated or if their home is flooded, we can help provide housing. However, um, unless you enjoy sleeping in a shelter on cots with several other people, you may wanna find another uh, place to go. So check in with your friends and family members that may, may live a little bit outside of your area. Um, maybe their areas are not gonna get as affected by your by your disaster. So check with them. Would it be okay if we stayed for a few days? Have that plan so that you aren't caught off guard. And I'll say in addition to that, it's about your pet too. So is your pet able to stay with them? So, you know, we uh, partner with the San Diego Humane Society and they will co-shelter along with our human shelter, a pet shelter, typically for dogs and cats. And then they have elder shelters for horses and other, um, other animals. But Again, it's, they're in crates and it might not be what they're used to. So have a plan for that pet as well, where they're gonna go, who can they stay with if you have to evacuate. And then the last thing I have to mention is transportation. So there are several people in your neighborhood that they may not be able to drive themselves. Please check in with each other. Take care of your neighbors. Know whether or not there are neighbors that can't get evacuate themselves, that can't drive anymore. We have, um, people with access and, and um, disabilities. We wanna make sure those people are cared for and have a plan. Um, but also if you yourself are not able to get yourself out safely, who are you gonna rely on? And do you have a backup person to help you with that? The next thing I wanna talk about is the alerts. So in the news, you'll hear these words get tossed around, just be aware. I think a lot of them are kind of self-explanatory, but it's a good thing to remember that a watch uh, a flood or a flash flood watch is when they're telling you that it's possible that a flood or flash flood could happen. So it's already starting to get you to be aware that this is this is happening. It could happen. So you know it should start to trigger some thoughts about okay, what would I do? Now the warning is much more dire. It's saying that the flash flood or flood is actually occurring or it's imminent. It will happen. So that is when you should already be taking action. You should have your plan. You should take some extra steps and we're gonna go into what those steps are. So this is what a, a screenshot of what a news um, would actually be telling you. They'll actually point out the areas that are at the higher risk. They'll say which areas are the watch and which ones are the warning. Um, and what they're gonna tell you is that uh, if they have an evacuation, which just in January, uh, Riverside and San Bernardino were issued a warning, they had to get out. So there was not an option, there was a mandatory evacuation. And those are the things you're not gonna get much warning on that. They're gonna have to, you're gonna have to get out quickly. So you should be preparing to evacuate. Do you have your disaster kit? Is it ready? Is it replenished? Is it up to date? What about your pets? You gotta bring them indoors, bring their get them in crates, um, secure your important documents. Do you have everything in one place? You do not wanna lose some of those documents, including your um, insurance plan, uh, maybe your marriage certificate, your driver's license copy, your passport. Those are important documents that do take time to replace. So it's best that you have them secure. Um, the other thing I'd mention is that when you have a warning and even a watch, you should be monitoring your local radio stations that are talking about uh, the, this potential flooding. NOAA has a radio station and their TV news will be um, giving updates periodically. You have to stay attuned to that because in rain weather, it can shift very, very quickly. So you wanna be aware of what's going on and what areas are affected. And then if you still have time, again, it all depends on if you have time, you should be filling your plastic bottle, water bottles with clean 
water for drinking. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the water systems can be uh, turned off. And if that happens, do you have enough water in your household um, for your entire family? Uh, also gas, make sure your gas tank is always full. Here at the Red Cross, we keep our every emergency response vehicle at least three quarters full, mandatory at all times. Um, I personally do it for my home vehicle at least half at all times. And that's because you never know how far you're gonna need to drive. And if the electricity shuts down and our systems are overrun, those gas stations are not gonna be able to provide you with gas, those pumps will be off. So something to think about and make sure you're ready. Now, during a flood, if one does occur in your area, you need to get to higher ground now. So uh, we have an area here in San Diego that is notorious for flooding, even in a minimal amount of rain. Don't go to those areas. Stay away from those underpasses, dips, the low spots, canyons. All of those areas collect a lot of rain really, really quickly. So you wanna make sure that you're um, staying out of those areas. And I would mention it happens all the time, but don't walk, swim, or drive through the flood water. Now you've seen it on the news, people having to get rescued. It happens constantly. Everyone overestimates their abilities or maybe underestimates the rainwater. Turn around, don't drown. It is not worth risking your life. As I mentioned, those very low thresholds for knocking you off your feet or moving your car are extremely high. People every year have to be rescued out of their cars because they think their car can make it. Don't try, go a different route, turn around, don't drown. And then uh, the other advice I would give is avoid contact with that, that flood water. So as you can imagine, that water is coming from all, uh, all sorts of areas. It is collecting a lot of debris, but also a lot of bacteria and, um, and other things. You do not wanna be touching it. Stay out of it as much as possible um, because it, even like a small cut, for example, could get in, infected. So you hey, wanna Melissa, stay Yeah. We have a question about that water. Okay. I should you fill your sinks and bathtubs with drinking water in case flooding water interrupts or contaminates the public water supply? All right, are you, let's see. Let's see what everyone thinks. True or false? You should fill your sinks and bathtubs for drinking water. All right, what do you all think? Oh, we're getting, our, this, this group is very responsive and so fast, my goodness. They are going to town and it's only 22 seconds into this poll. I love it. Got quick fingers out there. <laughs> this is fantastic. Well, let's see. I love it. Thank you, everyone. All right. Let's see what they say. All Let's right. A little bit of a trick question. The answer is false. Oh. When you, uh, when you fill those sinks and bathtubs, you do not want to drink that water. It's actually contaminated and it's not safe to drink. Uh, so we would much rather have you fill up your water bottles and, and store these in safe areas because those are safe for drinking. But drinking out of bathtubs and sinks are not recommended. However, you can fill it up and use that water for other purposes, maybe like cleaning the floor or washing your clothes. Uh, but again, it's not clean to drink. So yeah, thanks, Randy. That's, I, I'm, we caught people off guard there a little bit, I think. All right. Now we're going to talk about landslides. Uh, so on average, the lands landslides actually kill more, more than 8,000 people per year around the world. So they happen all the time and can really do some damage on the landscape. So they have really long lasting uh, effects. You may have seen recently on Highway 1, a huge chunk of it, and you may have seen the picture earlier, got dropped into the sea. So got knocked out by a landslide. So they happen all the time, but it can really disrupt um, all the, it can just disrupt transportation, but also destroy foundations of buildings and walls. And it also can disrupt sewer, water, electrical lines. It can knock all of it out. Um, and very, very quickly, the destructive force behind a landslide is pretty significant. So with that, we're gonna do another question for you. Oh, and wait, go ahead, Randy, what do we got? But before that question, okay, uh, we had a water water question. Uh, well, what if you boil that water in the in the bathtub? Although you might not have electricity, and it could be a challenge with how you boil it. What yes. would you say, Melissa? 
Yes, if again, if you're able to boil it. So I don't, again, if I don't know if you saw the news, but a lot of the houses in Texas, for example, ran off of electric, electric devices. And when their power went out, they didn't even have the ability to boil uh, the water. So yes, if you have the ability to with gas, uh, you have to boil it, but to ensure that it's safe and then um, obviously let it cool. But yeah, that is an option, but it's not necessarily always an option for everyone, depending on what kind of devices you have. So great point. Great point. Well, thanks, yeah. Melissa. Yeah, so, thank you. So we've got a true false question here. All right. And that question is, landslides are caused by disturbances in the natural stability of a slope. They can accompany heavy rains or follow droughts, earthquakes, or volcanic eruptions. True or false? What do you think? I think this is the fastest responding group I have it in with. <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday. People are excited for the weekend, right? Either that or the espresso. I have no idea what that, that could was. be too. That could be too. I'm on. I'm on a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's well, let's let's end this poll. All right. And see what people said. And you are right. I think that was a kind of an easy one. It was pretty. It was pretty easy, but yes, landslides are the disturb disturbances in the natural stability of a slope. So for example, a huge earthquake could actually take out a big chunk of the land and it would slide down the mountain. Now, on the other hand, mudslides, which are very, very similar, and actually the two can uh, happen at the same time, but mudslides actually develop when the water is rapidly accumulating and then it kind of soaks in the ground and gets a um, it gets all the debris and the soil, and then that was rushing down um, the side of the, of the hill. So they're very similar, but again, landslides don't necessarily need water in order to activate them. Um, I was watching a very terrifying video of a landslide in uh, Washington State in the 80s where a volcano erupted and a huge chunk of the, of the mountain collapsed and, um, and slid down the mountain. It was pretty terrifying in that that uh, to see all the the effect of that, the long term effect, it changed the entire landscape of that area. So yeah, so good. Everyone's everyone's pretty on it today. So good to see. Uh, so to talk a little bit more about mudslides, though, I want to just kind of draw a little picture. So on your screen, you'll see the anatomy of it. Um, so that's why the rain accumulates in, in the high areas, and then it works between the grains of that fine soil. And as it goes down that hillside, it keeps accumulating more and more and more. Uh, finally, it hits everything downhill. And a lot of uh, downhill, especially in California, we have a lot of our roads that are on mountainsides. So you can imagine any time the mudslides happen, it is the potential of washing out that entire side of the hill, including the road. So they are more likely in areas with previous landslides. So those tend to go hand in hand or recent wildfires. And actually, we're going to talk about the wildfires because Wow, it was a year for us. It was a very, very scary year um, in California with wildfires. Just take a look at this. So that is a heat map from September. We, almost the entire West Coast was on fire. A lot of you remember, some of you may have even had to be evacuated. I know our amazing Red Cross volunteers were out there helping these families and working around the clock to provide help. It was pretty horrendous, um, but with that, and you can look on the screen on the right, this shows the burn scars. So <clears throat> these in particular are the largest that happened in California, the uh, SCU and the CZU lightning complex fires. Those were bad. They, they actually created a huge area of damage. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, the, the darker the color on the screen actually shows that there's little to, and, or, or no live vegetation. So it completely disrupts the landscape. Um, when nothing can grow there, you can imagine there is a, this huge void and therefore rain can accumulate and just wash right over that area. I'm gonna give the, this next uh, slide here actually shows a little bit more about the, the steps. So before a, a fire, you'll see that, that that first layer of soil actually absorbs a lot of the rain typically. So that's a healthy fire, I'm sorry, a healthy forest before a wildfire. Now during that wildfire, um, the, it burns that top level of vegetation and underneath it, it actually creates almost like a, 
a slick, it's a repellent. So, so it has this, this um, top level that actually will not allow a lot of the absorption into uh, the subsoil below. And after the fire, as you can see, there's that ash and burnt topsoil and then the water repellent soil. So all that rain, when it comes down, it's gonna just collect all that ash and burnt topsoil and it's gonna wash right down. So all of those areas in California that were burnt are at risk of having a, um, a mudslide area because they, they, the soil has been disrupted from the wildfire. So again, you'll see that um, San Bernardino and Riverside counties were um, affected by the Apple Fire and they are at higher risk now of having not only flood but landslides due to that Apple Fire. So it has what these wildfires have lasting drastic effects on the landscape. Um, and so it's really important that we're at a heightened alert in those areas. Well, well Melissa. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, we got a poll. Yeah, I'm just, Let's do it. I'm wondering, you know, is there any possible warning sign that there is going to be a possible landslide? Let's see what y'all think. So could it be that there's going to be some kind of noise uh, or my house will shake or anything on the ground? I'm just wondering. Let's see what everyone thinks. All right, see a couple of you, your answers are in. All right. All right. So let's see how we fared here. All right, most of you got them right. Absolutely, all of the above are potential signs that you could you could experience a landslide. So, you know, when when you have the doors or windows that stick or jam for the first time, that means there's some kind of shift. Something happened where now it's too tight to operate properly. Um, the popping, creaking, knocking. If you are uh, interested in hearing it, there are actually some really terrifying videos that that record not only the the picture but also the sound of a landslide. It is this rumble and the cracking of huge trees. You can just it sounds like out of a movie. It is so intense. But you'll if you hear that. It could be it could be that a landslide is happening. Um, I will say even slight ones though can potentially lead to um, that there is a higher risk of having a landslide. Um, the changes in your landscape, such as patterns or like the storm water drainage, those things also could to, could be things to look out for. And then new cracks definitely as well. So those actually are all signs on how a landslide could potentially be possible in your area. So be on the lookout. Be aware. Make sure that if you do see those things, investigate, check them out. And, and if you need to, you might want to take some steps to um, prepare for one. All right. Now I want to go into a little bit about recognizing those warning signs. Um, again, those cracks and leaks are really important. Um, this diagram here is just talking about that. Uh, so on that slope, you see the cracks in the ground. That's exactly what it will start to look like. And you might even see some falling some falling gravel or, or rock coming down. Um, Randy herself experienced something. I don't know, Randy, you wanna mention what you experienced? Oh, sure. Uh, and I'm so glad it wasn't my fault. Uh, this is one of those where it's like, thank goodness it was my husband's. Anyhow, uh, in our canyon, uh, we had this magnificent pine tree uh, that even we even named it, it was Harold. And uh, we made the unfortunate uh, mistake of wanting to care for it so much. We had an arborist. Uh, we were supposed to water at a certain time, uh, but we didn't stop the watering. And, uh, and the water company doesn't remind you when you have spent 100,000 gallons of water on your hillside until the tree went down the hill as well as with the landscaping as well. Uh, so many thousands of dollars after that to reinforce our house and the hillside and build our own little wall happened from uh, not remembering to turn the water off and the sound. So if anyone ever asks you uh, if, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, does it make any sound? You better believe it makes a lot of sound. <laughs> yes, thanks for sharing the story. But it's a good example that, you know, even things man made 
problems can actually create a landfall. So Randy lost a big chunk of her hillside and caused several thousand dollars of damage. So just be aware that uh, there are some signs and be on the lookout for them. Now I wanna talk about after. Um, this picture on the right always uh, stresses me out. I'm somewhat of a neat freak and I can't imagine mud pouring through my home. But the first thing is let people know you're safe. So the Red Cross has a safe and well website where uh, it gets activated anytime during a major disaster. So you can let people know um, that way, but just again, ha having that communication plan to let people know. Um, and watch for any kind of hazards. So afterwards, as you can imagine, a lot of additional hazards exist. So mold is one of the things I mentioned, um, but roadways can be down, you know, looking at highway one, imagine if you were driving on that when the freeway or the highway collapsed, you don't, you don't wanna be on that. So be on the lookout, um, make sure your water is safe to use. So a lot of the times the city will uh, issue some reports, whether or not it is safe, they wanna make sure that no one's drinking it if it isn't safe. So make sure to look into it ahead of time before you start drinking that water again. But take care of yourself. We're in a really stressful time. I know that everyone is going through a lot. It's, it's emotional when you go through a disaster. Um, we are, a lot of us are, the Red Cross are there the first, um, uh, you know, with these people when they've been evacuated or their home was destroyed. Take care of yourself. That is a traumatic experience people go through. Check in with your family members and your friends. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have to keep your household, you have to do some cleaning, but make sure your pets are also okay. And um, it's, it will have lasting effects. It's a lot of people have, you know, PTSD after some kind of um, event like this. Um, you wanna make sure that you're checking in with everyone and ensuring that everyone is mentally um, healthy as well as physically healthy. And then, oh yeah, go ahead. I had a question that came up. Yeah. It says, and this is from Ray, who is kind enough to write, it's my understanding safe and well will no longer be supported in the near future. Is that true? Yeah, it's gonna be a little bit different. Um, so safe and well is gonna change to uh, a different website. Um, but yes, we will still have a site though that allows us to um, check in with your friends and family and, and notify each other. So the Red Cross actually during disasters helps with uh, what we call reunification. So if people are looking for friends and family to see if they're out safe, and for example, maybe they can't get a hold of them, uh, then the Red Cross will connect them. So either way, the Red Cross will help with that. Um, for now, the, the safe and well is there, but again, it will be going away. Yeah, good point. All right, um, and the last thing I'd mention is the monitoring of the local news and NOAA. So they constantly will give updates about what kind of damage there are to the roads, um, whether or not it's safe to go in certain areas. If there is flooding, they're gonna, they're gonna say stay away from this area. So make sure you're monitoring those stations and making sure that your area is safe to travel uh, and go throughout. And afterwards, I have to mention, you wanna keep away from any loose or down power lines. So in, especially in landslides, it can actually wipe out huge areas of power lines um, in the mountains. So make sure that you're not getting anywhere near them. If you are gonna go in your ho households or um, in your neighborhood, wear protective gear, because like I mentioned, that water can have a lot of bacteria and, and even sharp objects. So you wanna make sure you're safe in going through. Uh, use a flashlight only. Don't put flames, um, don't add candles um, because you don't want a disaster on top of a disaster. Well, I guess we're already in a disaster with the pandemic. So a disaster on top of another one. So we just wanna make sure that don't use open flames. Flashlights are recommended, have extra batteries. They should be already in your kit. And if you smell gas, again, with landslides um, and even flooding that it can disrupt uh, lines, so your gas lines. So if you smell gas, immediately evacuate and notify um, and call 911 because obviously a gas leak is extremely serious. Um, and you wanna save you want to save and take pictures. So um, your insurance, like I mentioned, your homeowner's insurance does cover some damage. So anything you do immediately after. So if you spend money on cleanup items or you have to stay in a hotel because you have nowhere else to go, those are expenses that you can actually provide to your insurance company to get reimbursed depending on your plan. And again, you gotta have that insurance in the first place. So um, make sure you do, and then you keep all those receipts. 
And I want to recommend if you do experience a disaster, any type of disaster, but flood and landslide, contact the Red Cross. There's a great website, Disaster Relief and Recovery Services. It goes through everything that we can provide. Um, we don't just do lodging. A lot of people only call us if they don't have somewhere to stay. That's not all we do. Um, we have Lodging is a big one, but we also have um, disaster mental health professionals, disaster health services that can provide those assistance um, right after an emergency. For, for health services, for example, we provide medication, emergency medication, if um, you don't have it with you. And uh, mental health are people that can, are licensed people that can talk to you about um, the traumatic um, experience you went through. So reach out to us, we're here to help. And we've got incredible volunteers that help with these type of things. All right, now with that, this is my next question. It's now up to you. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Uh, I would recommend um, taking steps today. Don't put it off any longer, but can you all write in the chat? So bring up your chat box. And I wanna see what you guys are gonna do this week so that you and your loved ones are more prepared. So let's see what kind of examples we have. All right, give you a couple seconds to write. All right, I see shell batteries in our emergency kit. Yes, thank you. Check them, make sure they're working. Uh, I would rotate them out if they're old. What else we got, Randy? Well, while people are waiting, uh, while we're waiting for their results, there was a question about where uh, we might find this presentation. Sure. Uh, so that it can be shared with community members. So, it's fine. so what we've got is finish my go bag. Uh, including pet food, uh, make a copy of ID documents, uh, check the expiration date of the food in my kit, update my emergency plan, update the emergency kit for any expired items. These are great. I love it. Uh, on my, some people send it to me privately. Uh, stock up on a case of drinking water. Yes, water is one of the essential items for emergency kit. Uh, Sally, emergency radio, thank you, yes. Uh, I, there's some great ones online and they're fairly inexpensive. So go check them out. I'm going to make sure we have updated materials in our kits. Yes, a lot of people don't remember that th some items expire. So even granola bars, they have a long shelf life, but they do still have an explanation, uh, sorry, an expiration. So make sure to check them. Um, Band-aids after time can actually lose their stickiness. So that first aid kit needs to be checked. Those are great. All right, so another one is go over emergency plan and check our emergency kit. Yes, I like Brian that you said go over the emergency plan. A lot of people don't communicate. They might make this plan for their family and then no one else knows what to do. Make sure this is widely spread and not just when, within the household. What about your neighbors? What about your family members that live out of state? They're gonna be worried sick about you. Make sure you talk to them, say, hey, this is our plan. This is where we're gonna stay. If you don't hear about from us, this is what we're gonna do. I recommend having an out-of-state contact to relay information between um, people. So for example, I live in San Diego. My sister lives in Los Angeles. If there was a big event that affected both of us, we've communicated that our relay is my wonderful mother in Arizona, and she is gonna be the one that uh, connects us so I can relay information to Arizona and then my sister can as well and my mom can then pass on that information. What happens in a big disaster is cell towers get too overloaded where a simple exchange, uh, a, a call between people that live near each other is overwhelmed, but a lot of times the out-of-state contacts work. So these are great. Um, I have another couple. Yeah, please uh, keep coming. One was to get life straws for each mm. member of the family and to find to have that meeting spot planned for family yes. members. Yes, those are great. I, I actually have that straw, by the way, it's wonderful. I haven't actually used it yet, but everything I read on it is great. Um, I actually am planning a, a camping trip where I actually break out my emergency kit and practice everything just to make sure everything's working properly still and um, is, is to my liking because maybe there's things that I'm missing. So I love it. And having that meetup point for your family is essential. It should be not only in case of a home fire, so somewhere nearby the house that if you had a home fire, your whole family goes to. Um, that's a good idea because if people go out the back door and the front door, how are you going to know each other are safe if you're staying on those sides? So make sure you have a meetup point so you all know that each, that everyone's out safe so that you can report to the fire department that everyone's safe. 
Um, but then there, the second meetup point should be far enough away from your house um, if it is in a disaster area. So that's great. Thank you, everyone. I really want you to, to make sure to take these steps. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is some, some really useful uh, resources. So now these, there's a ton of things that Red Cross have. I really recommend going to our website. There is a, a just a plethora of information. There's a checklist, there's advice there. You can get as really detailed as you're that you're interested in, um, but go to it and see what sparks your interest. We also have these preparedness books and I should bring up um, the, the booklet is really great. I, I highly recommend it for everyone to take a look and it's not only for you, but share it with anyone that you think could benefit from it. So let's see, I'll put it here in the chat in just a minute, but check it out, see, see what uh, steps you can take. And here we go. So I'm gonna put it in the chat here. You'll be able to download it um, at your leisure. But again, if you want information from me, I'm going to right now type my email address. Please email me and I can provide you a copy of this presentation, but I also can provide you any kind of preparedness um, information. So there is my email. You have no excuse now, but you can't get information or you didn't know it was going to happen. So you're not going to be one of those statistics saying, I didn't think it was going to happen to me, right? Uh, other emergency um, uh, things that we have available. Uh, again, these websites are great. So there's the um, Homeland Security, the California Department of Water Resources, uh, FEMA is a great one, and National Flood Insurance Program has a lot of great information, including maps of, uh, of different areas. I highly recommend the Red Cross Emergency app for your phone. It is wonderful. Not only will it alert you in case there's a disaster and tell you what's going on, it gives you the step-by-steps of what to do and, and if an emergency happens. So I actually was in Arizona and I had never thought of an, a tornado happening in Arizona, but there was a tornado that touched down less than a mile away from my mother's home. And sure enough, my alert went off it told me to get into a room with no windows and it allowed me to wake up my mother and we both went into a room safely. So it is great. I highly recommend it. There's a lot of other apps. I know uh, we have some local um, apps. So San Diego County is another great one. That one will alert you and tell you even infrastructure question, um, stats of what roads are closed. Um, but there's a bunch of um, apps out there. Get one. They are great. They will alert you. Um, I will say it's it's also nice because there's um, different ways that can alert you. So um, for, for blind, for example, it will actually list everything um, and it will read everything out loud. You can also have it where um, it vibrates. And if you don't have great hearing, it can vibrate and then walk you through the step-by-step. -step. So um, uh, was, yeah, go ahead. Was that uh, Red Cross Emergency app just listed in the apps as Red Cross Emergency? Yeah, you can just type in Red Cross Emergency and it will come up. It's on the screen, it's that uh, exclamation mark. It is the best one and it will go through, um, I think it's 28 different types of disasters it covers. And what I like too is you can actually monitor different areas. So I monitor LA, I monitor Arizona, I monitor Oregon, where my other sister lives. So all these uh, different areas can be monitored so that you get alerts if there is a disaster in their area. That way you can even tell them, hey, there's you know, flooding happening. Are you okay? Do you have your kit? Are you prepared? Um, and I should say, connect with us. We're on all social media. It's, we do periodic updates. We post uh, recorded presentations. Please connect with us and uh, follow us because a lot of information gets pushed out. Even in an emergency, we'll send out emergency messages of what to do and where to go. Uh, so it's really helpful to have that information. And uh, finally, I wouldn't be a good Red Crosser if I didn't talk about volunteering. I love our volunteers. Um, I myself started as a volunteer and I have really enjoyed this organization. We do a lot of incredible things. There is really something for anyone. I won't go into too much detail, but there is so much joy from volunteering. If you don't volunteer with us, volunteer somewhere. The, the amount of different organizations that need help is overwhelming. Um, and I will say, especially during this pandemic, it is so fulfilling to know that you're helping others um, live a better day. So consider it 
Uh, on the next screen, I will show some contact information of our recruitment specialist. This is Kaylee. Uh, she could be reached out to if you have any questions about joining. She's wonderful. And again, there's so many different opportunities. There's something for everyone. So if you like doing finance, working behind the scenes, or if you like disaster response, or if you like organizing or presentations, there are plenty of opportunities. And uh, with that, I just want to say thank you so much for being hey, here. Wait, hey, yeah. Melissa. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Don't we have a quiz? Don't, uh, didn't we have a survey? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. <laughs> I thought we had a survey posted someplace. <laughs> oh, and you're muted. <laughs> Striking out here. Striking out. I like you're to say I owe $5 to someone if I... Okay. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> All right. So I am going to put a little survey up. It would really, really help me if you filled it out. We're always looking to find ways to improve. Um, if you have a minute to do it, please take a look. So this survey is very quick. It should only take you about a minute, minute and a half at the most. Uh, so please, please answer the questions and we want to hear from you. So I open it now to questions if you have any. And um, again, we're always trying to improve and get better at doing these. We wanna know how can we better reach you or people in your community. Uh, we always do presentations. We're welcome to do additional presentations if you're interested. And then finally, I wanna talk about our home fire program. We offer uh, free smoke alarm installations um, in certain areas during COVID-19 with the partnership of fire departments. Um, and we also are offering a free education, so one-on-one -on -one education with a trained volunteer to really talk about home fire safety in your home. So those are our uh, big programs we're, right now we're, we're focusing on. We experience home fires all the time. Uh, you may know that seven people die in a home fire every single day in the United States. Um, and again, it's one of those disasters where everyone says, I, I never thought it would happen to me. Well, you have a one in four chance of being affected either yourself or a loved one from a home fire. So it's a very good chance you will experience a home fire. So think about it. And I recommend going to soundthealarm.org to sign up for information. Uh, so soundthealarm.org forward slash SoCal. And I can put it in the chat for everyone. Any questions, Randy? Are we getting anything? Uh, there was a question about, uh, Will these sessions be repeated? If someone has missed them, uh, will there be more sessions coming up for the public? Uh, there may be. Um, I will say the best thing is the recording. So after this presentation, uh, we will post the recording on our website. If you're interested in receiving that website, please shoot me an email. Again, you have my email address and I can get you that information. Yeah, good question. Uh, again, or get you the, the link to all of our recordings. So uh, we've our, this is actually the third in the series, the third presentation, and the other two are already posted there. So yeah. All right, any other questions, Randy? No, that's all that I have right now. All right. Well, we are just uh, almost at one o'clock. I wanna say uh, thank you, really. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking preparedness seriously. Thank you for spending the time to, to think about it but I don't want it to end here. If I could really stress that I want you to do something, take action today from this presentation and making sure that your household is safe, making sure that all of your loved ones. So if you have a neighbor um, that has um, problems getting out of their home, please visit that neighbor, check in with them. Uh, during the pandemic, we're all going through a lot of stress. It's a, just a nice thing to do at a safe distance to say how they're doing and then ask them what their plan is if they have to evacuate. So again, I don't want it to end here today. I want you to continue your preparedness activities, do something, take action, be more ready to not only respond to a disaster, but recover from one. All right, again, a big thank you. I love seeing so many here today. Appreciate your time and uh, We'll see you next Friday, same time. And we're gonna be um, doing another topic, but we hope to see you there. If you do want the list, again, shoot me an email and I can send you the links to all those upcoming presentations. And with that, have a great day. Happy Friday, woo woo. <laughs> Bye everyone.